Hi, folks, and welcome to the final session of the PML Reading Group. Um, I'd like to thank Pinku for presenting tonight. We were supposed to have someone else present, and they actually canceled at the last minute, which uh, wasn't very, very nice. Um, so thank you very much for uh, doing this, Pinku. And um, uh, feel free to uh, go ahead and start. Okay, so yeah, sorry. So yeah, the, today we will see, we'll get an overview of uh, chapter 23, which is graph embeddings. So basically, uh, so far, um, ML models, deep learning models have been focusing on uh, information that has some sort of like a, like a simple relationship to other positions or data, right? So here in, uh, in graph representation, like graph embeddings, we try to model uh, data for like model uh, predictors for data which has some sort of relationship with each other. So the input here, the relationship could be like a relationship between two records or data items, or it could be relationship between uh, two components within the same record. For example, uh, the data could be an image. In that case, the pixels would have a relationship with each other, like a localized relationship. And this relationship is kind of structured in the sense that uh, like a pixel would be uh, usually connected or similar to its surrounding with uh, uh, more than some other further location. So this relationship, this graphical relationship can be represented with convolutional neural networks. However, data could have other more complex relationships. So the graph embeddings kind of focuses on how to incorporate those relationships into the model so that the model be, become more, more accurate or more representative of the data, basically. So here in the slides, it kind of summarizes those. So, in, so it kind of tries to, as I said, uh, tries to model the semantic relationship between training examples. And these relationships is uh, represented as edges and the nodes itself are training samples or it could be those pixels or anything else. Uh, also, when we see like a sentence, so sentence is a sequence of words. So this sequence can also be represented as a graph, as a linear graph, like one node is connected with the next node. So yeah, so that's one thing. And also we could also like, uh, like break it further into like abstract syntax tree. So like a subject is connected to an object with a verb. Like, yeah, so that abstract syntax tree is also a graphical nature. So uh, there are some, there's so one idea could be like uh, to convert the, like an input string into an abstract syntax tree and then input that abstract syntax tree into the graphical models. So that's one other idea. Okay, so yeah. Now, now this graph, this graph can be represented like in many ways. Uh, if it is a really big graph, like there are lots of nodes, then usually it's represented in a sparse manner. But suppose assuming that the number of nodes are very low, in that case, we can represent the relationship using adjacency matrix. So this matrix is just a 2D matrix with dimensions with n. So, so if a row, so a row would represent row and columns represent the nodes and uh, suppose the row one that represents uh, some node it shows the relationship with all other nodes so if it, if in row item ij is one it means that there's a relationship between node i and j so that's what it means and yeah n is the number of nodes and 
Also, so A is the adjacency matrix. So it just shows that whether there's a relationship or not. We also could have like a weighted adjacency matrix. So it would mean that uh, distance between uh, CT A and CT B is greater than the distance between CT A and C. So in that case, the weighted matrix would for A, C, A, B would be greater. Or yeah, that also. Yeah, and that is that. Okay, now this node that is represented by N, this can be, this can include a lot of features. So that features can be represented in an R and D matrix. So D is the size of the feature vector. So to get an analogy here, the nodes could be the words. So, and each word can be represented uh, in, an, in an embedded space, like, uh, like, like this, like when words are converted using word to vec uh, algorithm. So it kind of uh, maps the one hot encoding of the word into a compressed uh, embedded space. So that dimension of that embedded space would be D. So yes, yeah, so that embedded space would be the node feature for that like word to word basically. So that is represented by X. So all these definitions are required later on in the book. So they just gave. A, an overview here. Okay, now the challenges of graph, like graph embeddings, is that uh, there is no, like, suppose, like, there can be millions of, like, there could be lots of possibilities of graph alignments. So, what does alignment mean? It means, like, uh, uh, okay, suppose for a, a convolutional neural networks. Uh, we expect the region to be a square space, like the convolution uh, filter, that would be a square space or a rectangular space, or, but it could also be a circular or an oval shape. So we do not consider those. So that would be like an alignment. Like we, we expect the alignment of the nodes or the pixel to be a bit regular. So that's why we kind of assume that it would be a rectangular in nature but graphs can have different sorts of alignments. So we, we, we do not have a structured way of representing those alignments. Also those neighborhood structures could be different. So it's kind of related to the last point and similarly can be understood with convolutional neural networks. And lots and like if the graph representation is uh, very order in an orderly fashion, then we can apply operations such as convolutional convolutions but if the alignments or the structures are not like in orderly fashion then we cannot apply most of the operations that we use in in all the established uh, algorithms so for that reason we need to first uh, bring the unstructured data into a structured form so that we can apply the existing algorithms so for converting this unstructured graph into a structured form, this would be done using a graph embedding. So that's what graph embedding aims for, basically. So another way to think about it, it would be representing, it's similar to like representing words into the word embedding vectors. So in a way we are representing the graphs into a compressed and more orderly graph embedding vectors or space. Yeah. Okay, so that's that and okay. And basically the last two points just like kind of giving an argument why the structured algorithms do not work on graphs. So suppose the, when we apply some sort of algorithms, we kind of assume a, a lot of, uh, make a lot of assumptions or uh, axioms. So these assumptions depend on the structure of the data. So for Euclidean spatial convolutions that are used in CNNs, so it kind of assumes that the space, pixel pix is uh, Euclidean, like there's a spatial, spatial uh, relation basically. So the, the pixel closer to it, it would be more valuable. So that's the assumption of uh, convolutions. So these assumptions are not preserved for graphs in general. So that's what it says. So this study of represent, uh, representing in any arbitrary graph in, in a structured manner is what 
uh, is the focus of geometric deep learning. So deep learning, so we can see deep geometric deep learning as deep learning on non-Euclidean data. And also it could be representing uh, more like uh, more safe, like a more relational, relational type data, like SQL data, where we have relationship tables. So they can also be represented using geometric deep learning, where the nodes would be individual records and the relationship table would be the HS, HS uh, matrix. So yeah, that, uh, now, before we can apply geometric deep learning, we need to learn how to represent the graph for the model so this is uh, uh this is like uh, observed in graph representation learning so here it tries to learn low dimensional continuous vector representation for graph structured data now this learning can be unsupervised or supervised so the unsupervised one is similar to bert like those uh, unsupervised language model so it tries, to, so the bird tries to predict, like use the input as a reference point and tries to predict missing words or something like that. So similar idea can be used for unsupervised uh, graph representation learning. So here it tries to learn non-Euclidean, no low dimensional Euclidean representation, optimizing an objective. So, okay, let's just break it, break it down. So first we have the graph in a space and that graph graphical like graph relationship is represented by the intensity matrix so we can consider it as a space and by space we can also consider it as the memory required in a pc now we need to compress it so by compression it would mean like it would we can think of compression as taking less space in memory right so in a way we we tried to find a compressed representation of the adjacency matrix so so that could represent like a low dimensional Euclidean representation of the graph now this representation has to satisfy some objective and that objective could be like preserving the actual graphical relationship like even though the adjacency matrix is compressed it still it still represents the same graph so that would be the objective now so we can rely on the graph structure to learn the embedding so that's like we can re uh, depend on that agency matrix of the relationship data to learn the embedding so that's what it says now so this is unsupervised now supervised would be similar to BERT again where we have the BERT model and then we try to like fine tune it for specific tasks so similarly suppose we first we have an unsupervised uh geometric deep learning model now we are try we will try to super like fine tune it for specific tasks so that would so for that for specific tasks the we need to find like a low dimensional Euclidean representation of the graph so we so now we have labels basically like for unsupervised we, think we did not have any labels okay so so for specific down system that's what it says and this task can be uh, classifying nodes or edges or graphs. So yeah, and leveraging. Okay, now for uh, supervised learning, we can also use uh, leveraged. Uh, we can uh, use more additional information for the classification tasks. So for example, we can use uh, information about nodes or like that node features or we could use information about edge relationships like properties of the edges and also also information about the graph in general and there's a connected information with the last point so for infusing those information we could also look into how like knowledge graphs are incorporated into language models so there's one uh, paper called Ernie. so it kind of embeds uh, existing knowledge graphs into the language model such as BERT so so this the last point is similar to that point like how knowledge graphs are in, infused into the model okay now for the 
learning process of the representation learning, we can have two sets of learning settings. First is the transductive learning setting, and the later one, the last one is the inductive learning. So these are just big terms. So basically, the transductive learning is means that it's simpler and predict like it's uh, predictable in the sense that uh, what we are trying to predict, we have seen it in the uh, in the input. So the graph does not change, and we have complete uh, information about the graph. So yeah, so we are trying to predict from what we know. And for the inductive learning, it's more practical and it tries to represent uh, the environment uh, in a way that we, we do not have complete information about the environment, but we try to infer what would the output be based on my, our knowledge so far. So in a way, like suppose we land on a city and we explore the, like the region around us, and we make some assumptions that it would be in like the the properties that we see in the in our local environment it would like be similar in other environments so from those assumptions we try to predict what would the other parts of the graph will be so that's inductive learning study okay so uh so normally uh like the applications we have seen like the established application they use euclidean representation learning where there's a uh, affine relationships between the data sets so what does that mean it would mean like uh like data points that are uh, like the data points kind of have some sort of linear relationship with them but that uh, but uh, data could also have some non-euclidean representations yeah between them among them so these representations could be hyperbolic or spherical in nature so that would mean like uh, the space that the data points are in there's those that space could be spherical so yeah basically that so non-euclidean representation learning focuses on learning non-euclidean embedding spaces and the motivation here is that the continuous embedding space that represents resembles the underlying discrete structure of the input data could be could be like non-Euclidean. So, for example, the hyperbolic space is a continuous version of a tree. So, I don't know what that means, but basically, it's just stating an example. Okay, now we can uh, like see the graph embedding problem as a as an encoder decoder problem where the encoder part is tries tries to like learn an orderly comp and compressed re uh, representation of the graph that preserves the like the relationship information and the decoder problem would be could could be like tries to decode the original graph from the compressed uh, representation so that could be the decoder problem so the network input is encoded from the discrete domain of the graph. So by discrete, it, so it's by discrete we mean that we are using the weight matrix or the adjacency matrix. So that matrix is discrete. So that's why it's discrete domain. So the discrete domain of the graph into a continuous representation of the embedding. So by continuous we could think of the like the word vector representation of word token. So that's continuous in nature. So because it's continuous in nature, we can infer some sort of relationship between the nodes. So similar nodes would be close to one another. So yeah, so that's continuous representation. Here X, so for that representation, we can, we they use some uh, symbols. So the X would represent the features of the nodes and that's in the, uh, that's in the real ND space. And A and W are the like the like the weights. So A is the adjacency matrix. It just shows uh, whether or not nodes are connected. And weight W kind of represents the like the weight, like the how strong the relationship is. And those are in N N matrix and square matrix. And Z is the compressed representation. So here it. Uh, okay, so Z here it represents like the compressed uh, representation of the node. So this representation has 
uh, size L in vector, like the vector would be size or oh, has, will have L elements and the uh, real NL represents the, all the representations of the N nodes basically. And the learning, the learned representation Z is used to optimize a particular objective. So after we have the compressed representation, we can use that to optimize another objective. So it's similar to all other previously like fine-tuned models that we have seen so far. So it recon and the objective is could be like reconstructing the links of the graph. So that task would be the decoder part. So we could after uh, training it, so encoder and decoder, we just remove the decoder and then fine tune on a specific task. Okay, so so the graph in so this uh, encoder decoder can be viewed as a framework for training graph graphical neural networks, and we can replace uh, different parts of that framework based on our needs. So this framework uh, encapsulates a wide variety of supervised and unsupervised graph embedding methods. Uh, that utilize the graph as a regularizer. So we can use the graph as a regularizer. We can also use it as position embeddings. So, oh yeah, so basically like uh, invert, I think, uh, when we get the sentence, we also add positions, positional information of the tokens with the input representation. So that positional embedding can be learned using graphical neural networks. So that's what it's saying here. And the graph neural networks can also be used for message passing. So I guess it's the application in like computer networks. And we have also seen graph convolution. So it's more structured form of graphical neural networks, like the convolutions. Okay. And this input graph W and optional node features so the input to this framework could uh, will will be will usually be a weighted matrix w and optionally it could be the feature mat feature vectors of the nodes mm -hmm. and for supervised we have we can like train target labels for nodes edges or the entire graph so the labels could be for nodes so we could we may try to predict specific uh, names or labels for the nodes or we could like try to classify relationships so whether or not these two like these two nodes have a relationship but what type of relationship that is so we may try to classify that or we we may try to identify some sort of uh like what like what the graph represents in general whether it's a social network graph or a uh, i don't know some sort of uh, like company data graph, I don't know. So wh what type of graph this is, they, uh, the model may try also try to like predict that. So this uh, supervised signal is represented by all these labels. So these labels are represented by N, E, and G. Okay, so, so this graphical, wait. So, so the first part of this uh, framework is the encoder. So this encoder maps the like the adjacency matrix or the weight matrix and the features, which is represented by the second term, into a like into a compressed embedding space of NL. And this uh, model encoder is parameterized by that omega e. So, and this com combines the graph structure with the features. And yeah, that's what it represents here. And we, after the encoder, we have the decoder and that is represented by a mapping from the corporate space, from embedding space into an actual like, like adjacency matrix space. And that space is represented by NN and that is parameterized by omega D. And also for the supervised tasks, we can use the node, node embeddings Z to compute uh, similarity scores for all the node pairs. 
and yeah and that's that and yeah that's that okay after we have the decoder we can either remove the decoder part or process further in as a classification component so we can add a classification component in place of the decoder or after the decoder so that maps the embedded representation of the graph which is in nl space into a into a n y space so that y would be the level space and this level space is for each of the nodes so that's why n cross y and this is parameterized by omega s and we saw previously that s is represents is a set representing the labels for both nodes h and graphs so here s would be that represents that set basically okay and this output is a distinct distribution over the labels y s so it's simple it's just saying what are the possible labels for all the possible nodes, edges, and graphs. So that's what it says. Okay, now this, now after getting the labels, uh, like the, after getting the labels, this label is like part of the output. The, but the output can also be different other stuff. For example, the reconstructed graph similarity matrix that we got from the encoder uh, or the decoder also, sorry, the decoder can be used to train unsupervised embedding algorithms. Optionally, the labels bias can be used for supervised applications. And the label output space, y, uh, that is why is application dependent. So as we said, we, we could have node level classification, edge level classification, or graph level classifications. And for optimizing, like learning the graph, we, we have to like, like uh like model it model the learning in, in such a way so that we can use the existing optimization algorithms and for that uh, we need to represent the objective as loss functions that is convex in nature so that we can use uh, gradient descent and all that so so now we have like three sets of parameters uh, parameters for the encoder decoder and classification task so which are represented by e d n s and this is this uh, constitutes the embedded you know, like the parameter space so the loss function has to use this space to optimize the model so yeah so that's what we said it has three, three different sets of terms and we have the terms for the supervised loss uh, so so we have three different terms that utilize uh, this parameter space. We can have the supervised loss term, which is represented by that file symbol. So it compares the predictable labels to the ground truth labels. So it's simple, like it's just a classification loss. And we can have graph reconstruction loss uh, that LG recon. So it tries to penalize graphs that are not similar to the original graph so yeah so this loss kind of calculates how similar the current graph is with the actual graph uh, we can also have weight regularization like l2 loss and uh, like similar to l2 or l1 loss and this kind of keeps the like controls the generalizability of the model so we can uh, base this uh, regularization loss based on the priors that we know or we want to set on the model so this we could set a specific mean for the weights so this mean would be incorporated with the regularized loss so here is the like a like a overview of the framework and we can replace uh, any parts of this framework based on our needs so usually we replace the decoder and just put the classif uh, classifier, like the output uh, block in place of the decoder. So yeah, that's that. Okay, <laughs> now, okay, so I haven't gone too deep into it. So, but shallow embedding, graph embeddings, the, the, so we can have like, this embedding, this embedding can be in shallow in nature. So shallow graph embeddings are transductive graph embedding methods. So transductive means like we 
have complete information about the graph and we're trying to predict uh predict uh info like they predict something about the graph that we already know like we have the full adjacency matrix so and we, we're trying to predict some sort of information now this encoder function that we use to map this complete graph it uh, tries to map the categorical node IDs on into an Euclidean space through an embedded embedding matrix. So these nodes uh, are in the B space, and the encoder function is represented in by the equation in the center. So it takes uh, like the parameters e, and then it returns a linear like it uh, it takes the parameters e and then re returns back the same uh, parameters because it's kind of linear in nature basically so it's linear because it's representing the relationship in an euclidean space so the euclidean space is also linear yeah and this uh, this parameter space is in the has dimension and l and the embedding dictionary Z is directly learned as model parameters. And for unsupervised learning, this Z is optimized to recover some information about the input graph. So it could be like uh, predicting whether or not some nodes, the nodes that are connected in the original graph is also connected or close in the, like the compressed representation. So this is similar to applying PCA, but on graph graphical data. And for supervised tasks, this Z is optimized to predict some sort of labels. So it, the information here is a bit repetitive in nature. So we have, I guess we have seen this in the previous slides, but it's repetitive. Okay, this shallow graph embeddings can be represented in this uh, form. So the, we can think of it as a simpler, simplified version of the like the previous uh, framework that we have seen here. So shallow graph embedding is a simpler form of that previous framework. Okay, now we'll see into unsupervised shallow graph learning. So there are two main types of shallow graph embedding methods. So distance-based and output product-based. So the distance bit is very simple to understand. It just tries to minimize distance of nodes that are connected. So that's that. And this distance is represented by D2. Here, D2 could mean like uh, L2 loss, like similar to, like it, it might represent uh, squared loss, basically. So that's why it's two. So this D2 loss can be customized, leading to Euclidean or non Euclidean embeddings. And yeah, and the decoder for such models will be a node to node matrix. So this node to node matrix is, can, is similar to the weight matrix of the original graph and this weight matrix represents the distance of the nodes uh, based on their uh, compressed uh, representations so so the nodes in the original graph could be like uh, 10 10 uh, 10 miles away but in the compressed space it could be just one mile away so the decoder would return the distance as one mile like yeah so that's what it says okay so now the so further we can see that the unsupervised embeddings for distance and product based methods are learned okay sorry this is a copy of the previous uh, okay so so the embeddings for distance and product based methods are learned by minimizing a loss so all model has to have some sort of loss so this the loss for the graph this shallow graphical model is represented by the middle line so here we can see that we have the original weight matrix and the predicted weight matrix and we are trying to predict how different they are so here sw is an optional transformation of the agency matrix so yes and d1 is the pairwise distance between the matrices so so this pairwise so we are trying to like represent how different two matrices are and this this difference is represent 
can be like visualized using the D1 function. And this function finds the difference, pairwise difference. So for each pair positional position of the matrix, it tries to different how the individual parameters of that matrix are different. So it's similar to dot product and not matrix multiplication. Okay, now we have to, so so these distance based methods can be can have different uh, forms. So if we focus on Euclidean methods, then it tries to minimize the Euclidean distance between two similar or connected nodes, and we can have multi dimensional scaling. So what does that mean? It means that we have this SW, which is some distance matrix measuring the dissimilarity between nodes. Uh, and these nodes, so for example, this dissimilarity could be how proportional the pairwise shortest distance between the nodes are, and this distance D1, which we saw previously in the loss. So this D1 could be this uh, Euclidean distance. So this Euclidean distance is the squared difference between the values. So that's what it says here. Yeah, I've, I've covered so much like so far. Uh, my presentation ended, sorry. Yeah, do you have any questions uh, about what have we have discussed so far? There are a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm going through that. Uh, yes. No, like, mm, like that's like the that's how it should be represented, like the graph as a vector. Because uh, so for the if if the like we have in the wait, sorry, where is that? So here, if the learning setting is uh, simple, like node, like we already know how many nodes the graph has and the graph itself is small in that case we it's, it makes sense to use that as a matrix but if we even don't know how many nodes the graph has or yeah or if there are like lots of nodes like suppose there are like uh, 500,000 words so if you try to represent that as an adjacency matrix then we won't have any that much memory to represent it so in also, the adjacency matrix could be sparse in nature, so it makes sense to use a vector. So I guess uh, I guess researchers have explored that. So I guess it makes sense to use vectors to present the adjacency matrix. And how different is parameters? How different are parameters? Oh, uh, I haven't read it, but I guess the encoder and decoder parameters should be similar because they're they're like uh, like so the encoder would be a function and decoder would be an inverse function. So there could be there is a, some sort of relationship between the parameters between encoder and decoder, and the S is a bit different. So this S is a bit uh, task specific. So in that case, the S could vary a lot depending on the tasks, but I think there's a relationship between the encoder and decoder parameters. And for example, if you want to uh, I'm not sure, but it makes sense that it may try to predict some sort of mean. So like if we see into established literature of the graph theory so they're like uh, like uh, like a central centroid of the graph so it's the property of the node so for example if we have a data set like a normal distribution what we do we try to normalize it by like subtracting the mean and then like dividing by the standard mean so that the standard mean is between at least less than one and the mean is uh, zero so we could think of the encoder doing a similar process where it subtracts the centroid of the graph or it's like it uses the centroid of the graph to normalize the graph representation. We can we could also think of it like that way. Yeah, I guess it does something like that. Like, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't think I answered that well. 
No, I think that was fine. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much again, Pinku, for uh, taking the time to uh, put this together. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this chapter was interesting. Yeah. yeah, I wish the, the presenter who canceled had given me a little bit more warning, but um, I, I got the email yesterday morning, so didn't leave okay. very, very much time. And um, so this uh, this will be recording, and if you can send me your slides like yeah, sure. last time, that would be great. Okay. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good night. And thank you again, Pingu. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.